Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to this event organised by uh, LSE's Islamic Society. And it's part of the Discover Islam Week and it's to raise awareness, as you know, about the rich cultural, historical and spiritual dimensions of Islam and to promote tolerance, respect and intercultural understanding. Congratulations to all the organisers and especially to the General Secretary, Umaria Mohamed Yasmin, for doing such uh, a great job and also for choosing such a great topic for discussion, particularly after your focus tonight is the spread of Islam in contemporary society in the context of falling theism and a decline in religion. So my name is Diana Lewis, I'm a professor in the Department of International History and I'm also director of the Centre for Women, Peace and Security. And I've been asked to chair this event in line with LSE rules that if you want to invite external um, people to attend, then you have to have um, a chair. I'm also going to shamelessly promote my latest book, Women of the Somali Diaspora, Refugees, Resilience and Rebuilding. Well, turning to tonight's topic and um, tonight's distinguished guest speaker, as a historian, you know, we ignore in the modern world, in the making of the modern world, the rise and fall and the ebb and flow of religions and religious belief at our peril. There's always huge debates amongst historians about the reasons for uh, that um, ebb and flow. And in Britain, we see this dramatically in our island um, history. Everywhere we see it, the long-term history over the um, hundreds and hundreds of years of the change in religion. We see it where I come from, especially, which is South Wales, uh, in the landscape. One of the main features that we have is the decline of religion from the 19th century, where all over Wales you have abandoned chapels. They were built in the 19th century on the back of the Industrial Revolution, and now we see them as maybe bingo halls, maybe second homes, um, um, even pizza parlours, I've seen them. Secondly, we also see a change in what were once Christian places of worship where they become new forms of consecrated sites of worship. So near to where my mother lives, for example, a very ugly 1960s building, which was a Seventh-day Adventist church, about a year ago now has a beautiful golden dome on the top. So I'm wondering what you, yeah, you choose that, of what that now is. And then thirdly, and most shockingly, when I was uh, in Wales last summer to pay pilgrimage, uh, to where my father's resting place is, um, I came across in this beautiful valley where, where he is. Um, I was hoping for peace, tranquility, continuity, lack of change, only to find, just as I was trying to commune with him, I turned to my left and there was the signs of a neo-pagan shrine full of paraphernalia to do with um, worshipping, respecting um, animal spirits. So that's quite a shock for me, and I'm still getting over it. But anyway, turning to um, tonight's speaker, it's with great fascination and interest I introduce Paul Williams. So Paul will be known to many of you, and I don't need to give much of the introduction, but he's born, he was born in Essex and moved to London. And although he describes it as a very uninspiring story, he went through two major conversions. Uh, I think we'll be hearing more about this uh, in his talk. He's also the uh, author of Blogging Theology, and he has um, on this um, blog representatives of all the Abrahamic uh, faiths. Uh, and he's well known for his very scholarly, he's got lots of books behind him in your video, but they all look they've been very well read, I have to say. It's green screen. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, he also has uh, done quite a few interviews on YouTube and the Islamic channel. He never shies away from controversial topics, but I hope we won't have too much of that tonight, it's only Monday. Uh, so uh, he's going to explore tonight um, the factors in the decline of theism in the West, and he's going to contrast that with the growth um, of um, Islam. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to tonight's speaker, Mr. Paul Williams. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Let me just, uh, peace be upon you, if you didn't know that. And uh, it's a great honour to be here. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. I've never been introduced by an LSE professor before, so this is a first. Um, and uh, I'm just going to, there's kind of three parts to what I'm going to say. This is my own brief story, 
Then I'm going to talk, um, I've been asked to talk about the emergence of uh, atheism and the lack of belief in theism in the West. So that's the kind of boring academic bit, I think, where we'll talk about the going back to uh, people um, like um, Feuerbach and Freud and, and others, French Revolution. And then uh, in the last bit, I'm going to talk about um, Islam, of course. And based on my interview with a, a, a professor of religion and sociology at King's College, not far from here, um, about this very subject, the Islam in Britain, which is undergoing some remarkable progress at the moment. So there's a kind of three parts. So the first part is uh, the most boring part, which is about me. Um, so that has been correctly said, I was brought up in Essex, which is this, lots of jokes about Essex men, by the way. Do you know any Essex jokes? They're awful. Anyway, they're, they're never very flattering, particularly if you're the male in the story. I'm not going to repeat anything. So I was born there and brought up there in a very kind of secular family. It wasn't anti-religious, just nothing religious really. And um, in my early 20s, uh, I, uh, I remember I, was, I moved to London, that's right, and I was cycling back home one Sunday morning, having been to a pretty riotous all-night party in South London, about which I will say nothing. But I was going up Upper Street in Islington on my bicycle. A beautiful sunny day on a Sunday morning. I wasn't a Christian, I wasn't a Muslim, I wasn't anything. I was just, like, secular, I suppose. And uh, I saw this church. I think it was um, St. Mary's Church Islington. It's an Anglican church. And I was just struck by the beauty of the book. quite like architecture. It's kind of classical architecture, beautiful lines, and looked very nice in the sun. I decided to pop in, because it was open for no particular reason, and um, not to worship or anything. I was just curious, really, having cycled all the way back. And um, I, I remember, even I remember even today, um, nothing externally happened, but certainly I felt um, a very, very powerful presence, uh, which I experienced as love, but if I want to put a word on it, I mean, words don't really mean much in these contexts. They don't really express the reality of what happened. It didn't take a form or it didn't communicate. It was just definitely outside of me, and it was kind of, whoa, it was full on. And I really didn't like it. Like, I hadn't come into this building to experience something like that. So I thought, oh my goodness me, unless I leave fast, I'm going to break down. It was that, it was that kind of existential, for me anyway. So I left and thought, goodness grief, what on earth is that? <laughs> and of course, I went back a week later hoping for a repeat performance. I thought, wow, this is amazing, because nothing happened. But, um, but this had the, the, a, a longer lasting impact. It kind of led me to think, maybe I should begin some kind of spiritual journey. And because of my very nominally Christian upbringing, I went to my local church in Megavel, near where I lived. And, um, and after a year or so, I became uh, an evangelical Christian. Um, so I was a Bible-believing, evangelical, charismatic, born-again Christian. I can even tell you exactly when I became a Christian and became born-again, like you do. And I believed the Bible was inerrant and Jesus was God and... You know, all the typical conservative evangelical beliefs that attend to this denomination. And, uh, oh, great, you know, I was part of a great fellowship, lots of lively worship, it was a very nice community of people. Uh, I was a Baptist, actually. Um, and because of who I am, I took a great interest in reading the Bible. Because I had to go and I actually borrowed a copy from the library, I didn't know how to get hold of it. Anyway, so I, I started to read this, and it was the Word of God for me. I mean, literally, the word of God. And I started, when I read the Gospels, I started to notice things which struck me as incongruous, believing as I did, that Jesus was God and this was the inerrant divine word. And that led me to, I, I saw big problems. And I thought, well, maybe this is Satan trying to undermine my faith. So I went off to bookshops and I got biblical commentaries by Christian believers. And I, and I found that it wasn't Satan trying to trick me that these were actually problems in the text that had been noticed by scholars for many, many years, a couple of centuries actually, um, to do with eschatology, to do with Christology, to do with errors and so on. And I didn't actually get any answer, it actually made it worse because then I realised that what I was seeing was really there and, and these were issues that we're trying to sort out. Um, 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 um. Poltergeist? No? Okay. Um, so, uh, and, and in my readings of, in my reading in biblical scholarship, I discovered other problems I wasn't even aware of 
serious problems. And without going into these now, because it's not the right place, but what I developed as, as a human being was a very split personality. On the one hand, I still went to church and I prayed and I worshipped and I believed all that I did. On the other hand, a separate part of me, if you like, was riddled with doubt and angst and curiosity and great interest in scholarship and to try and find out as much as I can about what's really going on here in this religion. And it was a kind of, it actually came quite painful psychologically because I was being split apart. And this went on for years, you know, I didn't, I just lived with this. And yes, I did talk to the occasional minister look, looking for answers and no, they didn't really have any. <laughs> it was, so I just, I felt like I was limping along as a Christian, I, I, as if I was somehow very disabled in a way. I couldn't function in the way I wanted to. So um, one day, and I became, uh, as a concomitant of that, I became uh, actually quite Islamophobic. Uh, where I live in London still, in Native Realm, just down the road in Edgware Road, if you know the area of Edgware Road. Uh, there are lots of, um, I don't know, lots of Arabic uh, cafes and restaurants and stuff. And of course, I assume they were all by, owned by Muslims, which is not true, because you could be like from Lebanon or Nigeria, you could be a Christian or whatever. Anyway. Um, but in my conservative evangelical mindset, I became a little bit fearful of this. And I thought, well, the Muslims are coming further and further up the Edgeware Road, we're going to enter into Native Vale next, God help us, you know? <laughs> and um, but I, I didn't outwardly manifest anything at all, any Islamophobic behaviour, but it was just an, inter- uh, an growing anxiety about the world I was seeing around. Me. So I decided one day, because um, I kind of knew the media didn't always represent religious discourse accurately. I knew they didn't on pro-life issues, for example, or Christianity. I thought, well, maybe what the media is saying about Islam isn't true, but I'll find out anyway. Is it really a threat to civilization, to the West, to, to women, to you know, all these tropes that one hears in the West? So I decided just to literally walk into Regent's Park Mosque uh, in Regent's Park, um, and... Um, Without any appointment, I just walked in, and I remember on the left, if you know the place, and you walk in, just on the right, rather, there's a bookshop. But, ah, bookshops. <laughs> I know what that's about, so I went in there. And, um, and that started a process of discussion with the Muslims there, arguing, because I was a Christian, um, for several, well, a number of months, until ultimately I discovered something that I didn't know existed, and that's called Islam. I mean, real Islam. And I discovered some amazing things. Above all, I think the two things that I treasured and still treasure most. One is the Quran itself, it's an extraordinary book. And secondly, the life of a man called Muhammad upon him be peace. What an extraordinary life. I mean, I've not I've been taught about this at school, or any, anywhere really. What an extraordinary human being. And that blew my mind actually. I thought, oh, look, look, this, this guy talks like a prophet, walks like a prophet, speaks like a prophet. Could he really be a prophet? You know? So ultimately, I decided that he was. And, I, and the big issue for me was this. It wasn't so much the intellectual ascent to his prophethood, which in a sense is quite easy, because you know he behaved like he talked like he was like a like Moses, a figure like Moses in many ways, who we all accept as a prophet, whether we be Jew or Christian or Muslim. No, it wasn't that. It was the sense I'd be crossing over a civilizational divide. So here was I, a white male, part of the Mitrarosi population, crossing over in embracing Islam into a minority position, identifying with a minority group that wasn't white, that wasn't the majority, didn't have power, that was despised and misunderstood. I didn't really want to do that, pardon me. I mean, yeah, there was a hesitancy. I'm just being honest here, folks. Just being honest, you know? Um, but in the end, I thought, truth is truth. Do I want to follow the truth or do I want to follow convenience and culture and my own desires? So, yeah, okay, I will follow the truth. So at that same region's part, Moscow, I said my name Shahada, Hamdina. Um, and I became a Muslim, of course. And that began an extraordinary journey, which is still going on, and um, boy, I've got a lot to say about that, but I'm not going to say anything about that tonight, because that's not what I'm here for, apparently. So, <laughs> um, so that was a boring bit over. Um, thank you for your patience. And, um, and now the more academic bit. Um, I've been asked to talk about... What have I been asked to talk about? <laughs> No one knows. No, maybe okay. um, I do know. Um, I'm supposed to be uh, right, reflecting on the origins and decline of theism, the historical trajectory of theism and, and atheism, actually, in Western societies, why that came about, how that came about, uh, and secondly, to contrast this with Islam in Britain. So I'm just going to give what I think is um, 
hopefully an accurate overview of the origins of unbelief and atheism and anti-theism in, in Europe. Do I have to cut both? Do I need both? It depends if the audience can hear you. Can, can you hear me without? The, good. It's, yeah, it's a kind of double finger. Really. Um, so I want, I want to just, just for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so, consider the, the main intellectual forces that I, I think have undermined belief in God in the West during the last 300 years. And, and then we'll come to the position of Islam in Britain and, and the incredible dynamic reality that it is now in, in, in this country. And I'm going to begin our, our survey with the decline of Christian theism, because obviously historically the West has been Christian, if you ignore, of course, Andalusia, and you ignore Bosnia, and you ignore the Ottomans. But hey, this is the, not the narrative we tell ourselves in the West. So if you look at the decline of Christian theism, beginning with the French Revolution in 1789, actually, which I think, uh, where, where when we'll briefly look at Voltaire, who was a famous French critic of the corrupt Catholic Church, and how the critique of Christianity is actually the first phase of modern atheism. It has, atheism in the West has its origins in a particularly anti-church polemic. It's not just like a philosophical belief, uh, really, historically. And discuss also the foundations of atheism, which are still influencing us today. And I'll touch very briefly on the thought of Ludwig Feuerbach, you may not have heard of him, maybe you have, Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud, uh, and briefly on someone called Richard Dawkins, who you might have heard of as well. Um, so our story begins with those Europeans uh, in the 18th century who believe that the only way to free humanity from its bondage to the past was to launch an attack on the one institution that was the ultimate cause of this oppression, and that's the Roman Catholic Church, of course, by attacking the ideas on which the Church is based. For an increasingly numerous and articulate group within Western culture in the 18th century, the best way to reduce the influence of the Church was to undermine the credibility of its teaching. While some people saw the attraction of atheism as lying in what it proposed, most actually saw its appeal in its ability to weaken, perhaps even destroy, the institution of the church. And this is the setting in which atheism as a social force, speaking sociologically here, emerged in the modern Western world. And paradoxically, the historical origins of modern atheism lie mainly in an extended critique of the power and status of the church rather than an imagined uh, attraction of a godless world. So the 18th century is widely regarded by historians as one of the most dynamic and exciting periods in Western history. It was an age of optimism with the whiff of revolution in the air. And by the end of this century, the ancient doctrine that the present was doomed to repeat the errors of the past lay in tatters. It seemed that a brave new world lay ahead, unfettered by the chains of tradition, and a rising generation could hope to enjoy a degree of freedom denied to their parents and to their grandparents. But it could only do so by eliminating what stood in its way, and there's no doubt on the part of the revolutionaries, the potential revolutionaries, as to what the great obstacle to human progress was. The church was seen as the enemy of progress by many, leading a, lending a spurious divine authority to the traditions of the past and the corrupt monarchies that depended on them for what little credibility they had, even the royal monarchies of the church behind them in France particularly. Perceptions of the extent of this problem varied across Europe and beyond, with France witnessing perhaps the most concerted and certainly the most influential critique of both the power of the church and the ideas on which it is ultimately based. In any event, signals, uh, if any event signals the dawn of modern atheism or kufr, unbelief, in the West, it's the French Revolution, I would argue, in 1789. Generations of accumulated popular resentment and intellectual hostility against the king, against the church, could finally be contained no longer. The storming of the Bastille on July the 14th, still celebrated today of course, of that year was widely seen as an icon of liberation, symbolising the sweeping aside of an old order based on superstition 
and oppression. A brave new world lay ahead, firmly grounded in nature and reason. These are the concepts they used. Firmly committed to the liberation of humanity from tyranny and superstition. The wisdom of the day was as simple as it was powerful. Eliminate God and a new future would dawn. It was a vision that thrilled many across Europe, including here in England, drawing aside a curtain from a once forbidden world, which now seemed about to become a reality. Atheism suddenly seemed conceivable for the first time as a social force. It had always been banned and persecuted in, in Europe, of course. And many across Europe began to think about it seriously. And this new world order that the French Revolution brought about was a turning point, I, I think, uh, in the history of the world. Now, most radical French philosophers of the 18th century are actually to be classified not as atheists, but as deists. They're often called atheists, but they're not really, when you read them. That is, they supported an ideal kind of philosophical idea of God, based on reason or nature, rather than a more specifically Christian view of the matter. People like Denis Diderot, you probably know these people, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, of course, social contract, and Voltaire, all of whom are regularly stereotyped as atheists and were actually better regarded as deists. Voltaire regarded atheism with about as much enthusiasm as he did the teachings of the Christian church. In place of both, he urged the reconstruction of religion on the basis of the supreme being disclosed in nature. And he wrote a lovely little poem in 1768, uh, which says, if the heavens, stripped of their noble imprint, could ever cease to reveal him, if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him, whom the sage proclaims and whom kings adore. So, I uh, just end up. We now look briefly at the intellectual foundations of atheism that are still impacting us today in the 21st century. I mentioned Feuerbach, Freud, and Marx. Now, Feuerbach, uh, born in 1804, uh, was a, a German anthropologist and philosopher. And his thought was really seminal in all the later thinkers, which is why we mention him now, I think. His basic idea, which he develops with an enormous amount of skill, is the idea of, the, of projection or objectification of human emotions and feelings and longings. The human mind, he argued, without being aware of what it's doing, projects its longing for immortality and meaning onto an imaginary transcendent screen and gives the name God to its own creation. And he wrote in a lovely bit of poetry almost, consciousness of God is human self-consciousness. Knowledge of God is human self-knowledge. By the God you know the human. And conversely, by the human you know the God. The two are one. What God is to a person, that too is the spirit, the soul. And what the soul, the spirit, are to a person, that is God. God is the, re is the revealed and explicit inner self of a human being. Religion is the ceremonial unveiling of the hidden treasures of humanity, the confession of its innermost thoughts, and the open recognition of, the, of its secrets of love, end quote. So, as I say, this is a really seminal thinker. He influenced Marx and, and uh, uh, Freud and others, uh, which is why I mentioned him. But he, he argues that religious people are unaware of this fact. They mistakenly believe that what they have created somehow exists independently of themselves. That's what he thought. Feuerbach thus lays the foundations for the criticism of religion by arguing that it is now possible to recognize religion for what it really is, he argued. Not a God-given set of ideas, but a human construction. Religion tells us nothing about God and everything about ourselves, our hopes, fears, and deepest longings. Powerful stuff, actually. This is a clever idea, even if it's wrong. <laughs> um, now, there were problems with Feuerbach's approach, as his critics were not slow to point out. 
The circularity of his argument was a particular concern. Feuerbach postulates, just states that there is no God, then turns to the question of why anyone would, do, why anyone would want to believe in God. Atheism having duly been presupposed, it is not unduly demanding to make it the argument's conclusion. It was also pointed out that if belief in God was a response to the human need for security, might it not also be argued that atheism was a response to the human desire for autonomy? So atheism is a wish fulfillment for those who are afraid of the light. You can, too can play at that game, Mr. Feuerbach. So, so not all individuals might long for the same things after all. So that gives kind of check there. We can't go, uh, we can't of course miss out Karl Marx, who spent a lot of time actually here in London. He was a German philosopher, obviously, an economist born in 1818 in Germany. And for him, the notion of materialism is fundamental. He argued that every aspect of human life and thought is determined by social and economic factors. And I know the irony of me telling you about Karl Marx in this establishment, so forgive me, you've probably already done all this. But anyway, he's a very, very influential atheist. Uh, this leads Marx to one of the most fundamental assertions. Ideas and values are determined by the material realities of life. And he gave a, a famous analogy, which has been quite influential. He argued that material reality was the foundation on which the superstructure of ideas was erected. People's social and economic conditions determine what they think. And this doctrine has highly significant implications for his understanding of the origins of religious ideas, of course. The idea of God is a human attempt, he thought, to cope with the harshness of material life and the pain resulting from, human, from social and economic deprivation. Now, Marx took a step of decisive importance. He, he affirmed Feuerbach's analysis of the origins of the religious notion of God, but he moved far beyond this. Feuerbach, as we've heard, uttered that, argued that religion was the projection of human needs. Uh, Marx agreed with this as far as it went, but his point was much more radical. Religion comes into being on account of sorrow and injustice, yet, yet these themselves arise through, social, through the social situation of the individual. Feuerbach, Marx argued, failed to take the social dimension of the individual seriously, tending to see people as detached from their social structures. If social conditions determine the world of ideas, it follows that changing those conditions will have a critical effect upon the resulting ideologies. And it's this insight that underlines Marx's often quoted comment on Feuerbach. I actually quite like this. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. <laughs> I love that quote. I mean, it might be wrong, but it's a, it's a great bit of rhetoric. So that was his criticism of Feuerbach. You just check, just interpret it in different ways. The point is to change it, in fact. Anyway, having argued that religion in general and Marx and sorry, Christianity in particular are direct outcomes of unjust social conditions, Marx declares that religion is so thoroughly determined by economic factors that it's pointless to consider any of its doctrines or beliefs on its own terms. So he doesn't even argue theology, he doesn't argue the traditional proofs of God, because they're all the byproduct of economic and social conditions. Uh, the origins of these beliefs are socioeconomic, not intellectual, he thinks. Whereas earlier generations of atheist writers had attempted to demonstrate the intellectual incoherence of the teachings such as the, the Trinity or the divinity of Christ, uh, Marx undermines them totally by insisting they are nothing more than the creation of purely social forces. And uh, we conclude this bit, that atheism is, uh, I would argue, that atheism is, so Marx believed that atheism was the natural ideology of a communist society. There'd be no religion, of course, there. But what's interesting, if we look at the new Soviet man that emerged in the Soviet Union in the 20th century, uh, as it was called, and this is supposed to be the archetypal person who was thoroughly godless and atheist. But what happened? The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and people 
flocked back to the church like, like never before. Religion had survived the imposition of communist and atheistic ideology. Now, before we come to uh, Richard Dawkins, I just want to mention uh, Freud. Um, he was a quite interesting character. He's the father of psychoanalysis, as you know. He also ended up in London for some reason. Uh, oh, in 1939, that's right. Uh, in Swiss Cottage, I think, for a while. He was born in 1856. And the most powerful, I think, statement of Freud's approach can be found in his book, The Future of an Illusion, in 1927, which, again, develops a strongly reductionist approach to religion. For him, religious ideas were, quote, illusions, fulfillments of the oldest, strongest, and most urgent wishes of mankind. We shall tell ourselves that it would be very nice if there were a moral order in the universe and an afterlife. But it is a very striking fact that all this is exactly as we are bound to wish it to be. It would be more remarkable still if our wretched, ignorant and downtrodden ancestors had succeeded in solving all these difficult riddles of the universe. Now, the parallels with Feuerbach are obviously evident wish fulfillment. Yet, Freud went on to develop a radical and original explanation of religion grounded in the insights of the newly emerging discipline of psychoanalysis, which took Feuerbach's critique of religion to new heights, or as I would say, new depths. That was a joke, by the way. Um, illusions are not merely deceptions. Are not de sorry, illusions are not deliberate deceptions. They are simply ideas arise from within the human unconscious as it seeks to fulfill its deepest yearnings and longings. And for Marx, of course, that was a result of social alienation. For Freud, the origins lie not in society, but in our unconscious. Now, was it a historical fact that Freud was a confirmed atheist long before he became a psychoanalyst? It's important to note that he became a psychoanalyst precisely because he was an atheist. His uh, indefatigable harrowing of religion reflects his fundamental belief that religion is somehow dangerous, and his approach to religion rests on the perceived need to explain why anyone would wish to take the extraordinary step of believing in God, since in his view there was no God to believe in. Now, it's interesting, when I, when I did philosophy, uh, uh, did my... Uh, at um, Birkbeck, uh, we did a, a course on Nietzsche, uh, the great 20th century, or 19th century and 20th century German philosopher. And I, I remember we would talk rigorously up to that point about how you know you need to argue through, uh, have evidences, and you have to have good arguments, and syllogism in logics, and so on. But when it came to Nietzsche, I remember the, the I won't mention his name, but the, the lecturer simply assumed that atheism was true, and that Nietzsche's statements on the non-existence of God were simply self-evident, Axiomatic, and I remember being stunned, thinking, "Hang on, whatever happened to the, the philosophical rigor was supposed to apply?" Suddenly, with Nietzsche, it just became unnecessary. And I think the reason was because it was seen as part of the, I don't know, the, the philosophical presuppositions of the course that God didn't exist, uh, and uh, and I thought that was quite shocking, actually, the inconsistency, as I saw it anyway. Enough about Nietzsche. Uh, anyway, the powerful criticism of religious belief initiated by Feuerbach and developed by Marx and Freud has had a huge impact on modern Western culture. Now, we may not know these names, as people in the street, so to speak, but this trickle-down, drop-drop effect on people's, uh, the kind of unconscious cosmology, if you like, that people have is very profound and doesn't come out of nowhere. It has a deep, ge it's a genealogy of ideas that impacts how we see things in the West. And these three figures I mentioned are absolutely key. Not the only ones, but they're three very key ones. Now, the credibility of, these, of their criticisms rested on the widespread belief that they were somehow scientific in character. In other words, that the origins of religious belief could be explained in terms of social economic factors or human psychology, in the same way that physics explains the movement of the planets or the optics of the rainbow. And belief in God was widely seen, therefore, as a construct of the consolation-seeking mind. So finally, we will come to perhaps the most famous or notorious representative of the new atheist movement, a chap called Richard Dawkins. Uh, 
I don't think I need, he needs any instruction, obviously. He's still very much alive. You can follow him on Twitter, where he's regularly often attacking Muslims and belief in God and all sorts of other things. Um, he's now retired, of course. And uh, I, I just briefly summarised his thought, and then I'm going to mention some of the very uh, serious criticisms of his views that actually other prominent evolutionary theorists biologists and zoologists, etc., have offered uh, to uh, the mention about him. So Dawkins, one of his most famous works, of course, is The Blind Watchmaker. Uh, I don't know when it was published, I think perhaps in the 80s, uh, which sets out, for the first time at a popular level, the basics of modern evolutionary theory and their implications, not least for belief in God. One of Dawkins' most important arguments is that the appearance of design in the universe we see around us can arise naturally, he thinks, within the evolutionary process. Quote, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Unquote. Dawkins plays, pays a compliment to the English clergyman, William Paley, uh, this is early in the 19th century, noting the plausibility of his ideas in a pre-evolutionary world how could Paley be expected to know, in advance of his time, that what seemed to him to be evidence of contrivance was simply the outcome of a long, blind, purposeless process of development? Dawkins says, "Natural selection is the blind watchman." So, natural selection is the blind watchmaker, blind because it does not see ahead, does not plan consequences has no purpose in view. Yet the living results of natural selection overwhelmingly impress us with the appearance of design as if by a master watchmaker. Impress us with the illusion of design and planning." End quote. Any argument from design must now be abandoned, he thinks, as the very notion of design has been discarded on evolutionary grounds. Evolutionary theory leads inexorably, he says, to a godless, purposeless world. Now, other scientists have been puzzled, not so much by his atheism, as by his insistence that this atheism is demanded by evolutionary theory. To them, Dawkins has shifted from a popularizer to a propagandist. So is Darwinism, not Dawkinism, but Darwinism, is it atheistic? In a critique, in a critique of an anti-evolutionary -evolu work, in a critique of an anti-evolutionary work, which argued that Darwinism was necessarily atheistic, Stephen Jay Gould, you, you may know, the prominent American uh, scientist um, and evolutionary popularizer himself, he invoked the memory of a certain Mrs. McHenry, his third grade teacher, who was in the habit of rapping young knuckles when their owners said or did particularly stupid things. And I quote, he said, to say, to say it for all my colleagues and for the umpteenth millionth time, he writes, science simply cannot, by its legitimate methods, adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. We can neither affirm nor deny it. We simply can't comment on it as scientists. If some of our crowd have made untoward statements claiming that Darwinism disproves God, then I will find Mrs. McKinnery and have, her, and have their knuckles wrapped for it. There's a scolding there if you ever suggest that Darwinism is somehow producing atheism. And Stephen Jay Gould insists that science can only work, that the scientific method can only work with naturalistic explanations. It can neither affirm nor deny the existence of God as such. And empirical evidence is of critical importance here. As Stephen Jay Gould stresses, this shows that some Darwinists are theists and others not. There is simply no valid means of settling this issue on scientific grounds. The suggestion that the Darwinian theory of evolution is necessarily atheistic goes way beyond the competency of the natural sciences and strays into territory where the scientific method 
cannot be applied. If it is applied, it is misapplied. Thus, Gould points out that Charles Darwin was actually agnostic, having lost his religious beliefs upon the tragic death of his favourite daughter. That's what triggered his atheism. He actually, his agnosticism, I have to say. He actually says this, Darwin. Whereas the great American botanist, uh, uh, Asa Gray, who advocated natural selection, was a devout Christian. Charles D. Walcott, the discoverer of the Burgess Shale fossils, was a convinced Darwinian and an equally firm Christian, who believed that God had ordained natural selection to construct a history of life according to his plans and purposes. More recently still, the two greatest evolutionists of our generation show radically different attitudes to the existence of God. G.G. G. Simpson was a humanist agnostic. Theodosius Dobzhansky was a believing Russian Orthodox Christian. As Gould concludes, either half my colleagues are enormously stupid or, or else the science of Darwinism is fully compatible with conventional religious beliefs and equally compatible with atheism. Although Gould himself uh, regards himself uh, as an agnostic inclined atheist, his admirably fair summary, I would I suggest, situ a summary of the situation favours neither atheist nor religious believer. The bottom line for Gould is that Darwinism actually has no bearing on the existence and nature of God. If Darwinists choose to pontificate on matters of religion, they stray beyond the straight and narrow path of the scientific method and end up in the philosophical badlands. And I'd just like to finish this part uh, with two, my two favourite quotes from Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, who's uh, uh, actually otherwise known as Tim Winter, actually, an Englishman. Um, uh, very pithy, you know, I just like it. I, I'm not going to explain what these two sentences mean, I'll just leave them to percolate in your brains. The first one is this. Atheism, the belief that water originates in the well. And the second one, this is my favourite, God is not a reality to be explained. He is the explanation of reality. Okay? I'm not going to explain them. I'm not going to explain them. <laughs> you can ask me what I think about them during the Q&A if you want. Now, the last part, um, and I'm just going to break to have some water, um, is about Islam in Britain and how what we just said relates to this. About a year ago, I, I, I had the huge privilege of interviewing Professor Linda Woodhead, who's a Professor of Religion and Sociology at King's College in London, up the road. And um, we, we discussed, uh, is Britain still a Christian country? And her answer was a resounding no and yes, which I thought was paradoxical. But no, that was her answer. Anyway, um, according to the 2021 uh, census, for the first time in English history, uh, fewer than half of the population now describe themselves as Christians. It's just 46%. So you can see the effects of atheism and secularism on, uh, it might be argued, on the population. Just 5% of the population now go to church on Sundays. 5% go to church on Sundays. But at the same time, there's a big rise in paganism, shamanism, alternative spiritualities, to do with angels, angel worship, and whatnot. Those who, who say they have no religion has increased to 37% of the population. That's up from a quarter from the last census. But it's really important to understand, this is what Linda Woodhead said, and she's absolutely right, this is not a rise in hardcore atheism or secularism. This is, this is simply a move away from formal religious observance, like being a member of the Church of England, being a member of the Catholic Church, whatever, to non-institutional, informal spirituality. Now, I remember when this census first came out on Twitter, lots of atheists were boasting about, aha, because 37% of the population are not religious, they say. Look at the rise of atheism. Atheism is finally winning. But this is completely wrong. That's not what the evidence is saying. It's a move away from institutional participation it's not a move away from so-called pagan uh, uh, activities at all. Now, 
6.5% of the population now identify themselves as Muslim. So what, why is this the case? It was a combination perhaps of immigration and, and conversion. Uh, and, and it's also perhaps indicative of the ability of Muslim communities to hold on to its members, speaking sociologically. But why is the Muslim community maintaining the integrity of its faith? I've noticed this. When, when, wherever one speaks to Sunni Muslims, the Sunni Muslims are like 90% of the world's Muslims, you can pretty sh be sure in a tick box of beliefs. You know, what, what's your Aqidah? What do you believe about the Prophet? What do you believe about the Quran? Jesus? It's going to be the same. I, I, it's extremely unusual to find anyone who has a kind of deviant belief, in my experience. And the same goes for questions of, of morality, whether it be sexual morality or other issues. There's a very clear consensus, uh, in my experience, of, of Muslims of any age, particularly younger people, actually. Um, so what, what, how are we to understand this? And, and Professor Linda Woodhead, being a religious sociologist, has her own theories, of course. Um, she suggests possible answers are that Islam doesn't require institutions to thrive, uh, that Islam is practiced and passed on generation to generation through families, extended families. So we're not dependent on clergy you know, and churches or you know, popes or whatever to, to do this. Um, there are numerous successful after-school places of learning. So there's this gra grassroots activity of, of learning about the faith. And she says British Islam is very creative on the world scene. It's seen as cool worldwide. That's her word. Islam is seen as cool worldwide. Unlike Christianity... Uh, she mentioned the influence of fashion, music, and of course prominent sports people who are Muslim or embrace Islam. And there's no clergy in control in, in Islam. And clergy are not seen as cool, of course, <laughs> in any religion. Um, th then she asked, will Islam be secularised like Christianity? And this is a really important question. And she was actually quite optimistic that it wouldn't, because one of the signs of decay, at least in British Christianity, say in the Church of England, was the... Um, the stultification of its intellectual life in terms of its uh, university level, it seems to have become very, very secularised and it's not really uh, vibrant anymore. But in the Muslim communities, we see intellectual strength and vibrancy in Muslim centres of learning, such as the Cambridge Muslim College, which she singled out specifically in Cambridge in England, uh, headed up by uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, Professor Tim Winter. Um, and also, uh, I, I would mention the Zaytuna College in Berkeley, in California. Um, and a new generation of scholars that are equally at home in the West um, and the Islamic tradition. So people like Hamza, scholars like Hamza Yusuf, Tim Winter, and the Cambridge philosopher Hassan Spiker come to mind. I mean, in, my, in what I do, I've been privileged to meet numerous uh, young, young generations in the 20s and 30s and 40s uh, uh, Western academics who are Muslims who are completely fluent in the Western tradition. They, they, know, they know all about everything we've both spoken about. They know all about it. And they know equally the Islamic tradition. They read Arabic. They, um, they, they know uh, the, the, the four matat. They understand fiqh. They understand qalam. They understand mat literally matariri, the atharis, and you know, all, all that. They, they are very, very switched on. So they're kind of like bilingual almost culturally. Uh, and that's extraordinary. Because they're both at home, and yet they're also aware of the, uh, of the Islamic tradition from the Muslim world. And that's incredible. And there's a vibrancy and an energy about these people who are really committed and keen to, 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 to spread their knowledge. And that, that, that's fan, fantastic. And she, she noticed this. So here we have a, a non-Muslim sociologist noticing this reality and con con contrasting that with the tiredness of their Abrahamic counterparts. And we, we take no pleasure in that. I mean, we want people to be engaged, but it's, it's, it, Islam is very, very active at the moment. Um, now, what, you know, another sad thing that, sh that uh, has been noticed, and again, I don't, we don't say this with any pleasure, is the church is often seen today as irrelevant to life. This is something that comes out in opinion polls. How relevant is Christianity anymore? Why go to church? But Islam, unlike modern Christianity, offers a comprehensive way of life. We call it the deen, of course. Encompassing everything in life, from law to ethics, marriage, inheritance, theology, the afterlife, 
giving answers to how to live successfully in all aspects of life. And uh, by the way, I do recommend you watch the, the interview uh, on blogging theology. Uh, is Britain still a Christian country? Professor Linda uh, Woodhead. And my, my final um, quote, I just want to read from some words from Tim Winton, his most recent book. Um, and I'm kind of asking the question, can Muslims truly find a home in the West? Can we, can we really make this our home? Because many atheists and right-wing populists will say, no, we can't, this is not... Uh, we're not going to find a home here. And Tim Winter actually addresses this the question uh, at the very beginning of his book, Travelling Home, Essays on Islam and Europe, which I do recommend. Uh, if you want to. So he says the following, and these are my final words, if you like, for the Q&A. Muslims find themselves at home everywhere. For the universalism of Islam enables a local routing which recognises that Wheresoever you may turn, there is God's face. That's a quote, obviously, from the Quran, uh, 3115. Such is this Muslim sense of belonging that believers feel more at home in a place than any atheist could, since to lose contact with God is immediately to forfeit one's sense of connection to a place of his making. It is to feel one's roots and identity shrivel. There can be no truly English, German or Russian atheist. From this kind of Muslim perspective, Lenin was not Russian. Douglas Murray is not British. And Sam Harris is not American. They seem to wait in a forlorn foreign encampment, even when officially at home. By contrast, to become Muslim or to arrive from an Islamically Abrahamic place and to maintain that traditional sensibility which perceives God's signs superabundantly everywhere is immediately to see the land with understanding and hence to begin to grow roots and to, and to adorn and engage the earth. Such, very roughly, is the Abrahamic theory of, is the, uh, is the Islamic theory of Abrahamic mobility. Unlike Israel's wanderings in exile, which await the Messianic intervention, which will take the people to a home greater than all homes, Muslims travel from one home to an equal other, and do not cherish a return to the mother of cities, except as visitors. They migrate Abrahamically, but every country for them is a promised land. That's page two of Travelling Home. So do Muslims belong in Europe? Absolutely. This is God's country. We are his people. We belong here. Atheists, bless them, do not. They cannot identify with belonging in that fundamental sense. So, uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was so scholarly and so interesting, wasn't it?